You're listening to Witham's Taxing Topics. When it rains, it pours. Tax regulations and guidance are dynamic, continually changing domestic and international financial waters. Step under Witham's umbrella to better weather the storms of tending taxing topics. We'll share the essential news and information you need to prepare for what's ahead. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to our Witham um, podcast. We're excited to be with you today. Um, it's it's early October. So um, as you know, we've kind of started to talk about from the very beginning tax reform from a budget impact perspective. And then we talked about uh, tax reform and how it could, could impact pass through entities. Then we went on to individuals. Um, and now we're coming back to talk about really what plans or policy proposals both presidential candidates have. So today's first podcast will address what we're seeing um, as a Harris tax policy proposal. And then our next and final podcast will address um, Trump, President Trump's tax policy proposal. So I do always, um, you know, tie it back, as we all know, um, to the budget, because uh, if you go back and listen to that first podcast, we uh, the, the deficit for the U.S. federal government is quite uh, large and we're and we're trending into areas that we've never uh, been before, such as um, now owing more interest to um, our debt holders, more interest to them is is owed as opposed to what we're spending on our defense funding. So really awkward times in that space. Um, so I'm just going to first um, say this week when they announced uh, the impact that President Donald Trump and Vice President Harris. Um, will have, their tax policies will have in the national debt. And so over the next 10 years, um, both candidates are actually going to be adding to the to the debt with their economic plans. Uh, they are estimating that President Trump would add $7.5 trillion, and they're estimating that um, pre- uh, Vice President Harris' proposals would add about $3.5 trillion. So in, in both scenarios, adding <laughs> more to the deficit, Obviously, in President Trump's scenario, adding um, four trillion dollars more, and that's over uh, the, the, the decade numbers, so ten years. So it's definitely something um, that we would anticipate might need more fine tuning or work. Um, but now we're going to really try to just focus and say, okay, what is what are the the main points that the Democratic uh, team? want essentially to make sure happens um, if if and when tax reform occurs. I think what I would remind everybody is even if the parties are able to agree and get a tax bill passed, I know if you've listened to these podcasts, you hear me say this every time, we will be having tax reform because we have a variety of sunsetting provisions that were passed under the Tax Cut and Jobs Act that have expired or will be expiring at the end of 2025. So I do think both parties agree that we need tax reform um, because they don't want to just, I hope, let all those Tax Cut and Jobs Act provisions, which primarily impact individuals and pass-through entity owners, to, to sunset without some adjustment elsewhere. Um, so we're going to kind of d- dive a little bit deeper in saying we're going to discuss the Democratic policies now Republican parties on our last podcast, but it's important to remember that we most likely will have a divided government. It's an anticipation um, that neither party will have a full sweep come November. Um, And so that really means when you hear me talking today about the Harris tax policy, and when you hear me talking about next week, uh, the the, the Trump tax policy, there's going to have to be some give and take. Um, And I think there's certain items that are up for discussion and probably agreement and some that are not. So let's start there. Um, so the Democratic ha- Party and Vice President Harris's policy are really um, consistent with what we've seen from the Biden administration. So as you may or may not remember, there was a Build Back Better uh, plan that was trying to pass um, a-, a few years ago, and they really were focusing on the earned income tax credit, They were focusing on the child tax credit. And so we will see these themes emerge and continue to emerge. So specifically, uh, the Harris campaign has said, we want to restore the expanded child tax credit that we saw during COVID um, with some at least 3,600 per child. 
So we would like to make sure that um, people who have uh, children, obviously, um, have access to support. As all of us know, um, the rising costs um, with children is significant. The, the second item they want to do um, is above and beyond just raising the child tax credit per child to 3,600, but they do want it to be uh, almost 6,000 is, is the proposal um, to families with newborn children and saying that they need additional help above and beyond um, the 3,600. So almost doubling a little uh, close uh, to, to making sure that newborn families um, indeed have, have that child tax credit. Um, so those are some of the major issues that I would say if if we're divided, right, um, those are going to be issues that I feel the Democratic Party is going to want some resolution to or is going to want to make sure that they have been have some type of uh, um, items addressed um, in, in a tax proposal bill that that would work. Um, on the other hand, um, the the rest of the tax policies um, that are being supported by Vice President Harris's campaign it are a bit uncertain. And so I, I would just caveat this, that while they have come out and they've been very clear of the child tax credit, the earned income tax credit, and they have been also very clear about a, a, a tax credit for ho- first time home buyers. Um, and in addition, in their economic plan, they even talked about a tax credit for um, c- construction of, of homes um, to be provided to first-time home buyers, um, housing is definitely uh, an emphasis of of the Democratic Party. However, um, when you talk about well, the consistent theme or the consistent talking point for the Democrats between both Biden and Harris's campaign is they're not going to raise taxes on uh, taxpayers with four hundred thousand dollars of t- taxable income or less, or less than four hundred thousand, I should say. And so the question then becomes. Okay, well, then what about those people who are over four hundred thousand dollars? And and this somewhat becomes, um, you know, a, a, a U.S. Um, debate, right? Because four hundred thousand dollars, as we all know, um, is is significantly different in in New York City or in L.A. or in you know high cost of living locations than it is you know, potentially in the Midwest. So, um, you know, I, I often visit the Midwest, my, my husband's from the Midwest and, and we'll see, you know, there are dramatic price differences, whether it be within housing, whether it be in with food, et cetera. So there's always been that discussion is, can you, can you make a, you're deemed, um, rich and should pay more taxes, um, across the United States with that, with that threshold limit. So that's one, but, so while they've been clear on that, and you would say, okay, for everyone making f- less than 400000 you feel very comfortable um, that the Democrats will support not increasing your taxes, then the question is, well, what if we're over 400000 then what? And that's the unclear policy that we're, we're seeing right now. Um, and, and it's not necessarily that they don't have a plan, um, but it's essentially that they haven't been very specific as to what that plan looks like. So I just want to make that clear that when I talk to you today about the various items within w- that we think the Democratic Party will support, we're really co- tr- focusing on the fact that uh, we're prior bills. So the Build Back Better bill is one bill that we would look at. We'd look at the most recent um, budget proposal by the, the Biden administration, and we'll say, these are things we've seen in the past. Um, we, we indeed don't know if they're going to continue uh, in the future, but it, it would seem they've been a consistent theme now for, for multiple years. So we would expect some change in this. So as everyone is aware, I think at this point, if you've been listening to these podcasts, there are are individual income taxes or or the tax rates um, will add an additional layer from 37% to 39.6%, which is um, not uh, to say that if you have an effective tax rate that's less than 37%, um, you could still see a tax increase. Um, essentially because not only is the tax rate being adjusted, but the bracketing. So, you know, the first $100 uh, dollars that was taxed at X rate, now it may be oh, only the first $50 is taxed at X rate, and, and we get into higher tax brackets sooner. So when you actually look at the pre-TCGA inflated adjustment rates, you'll see, you know, right now, um, you know, a person who is earning income of a hundred thousand dollars that their tax rate would actually go up right around two thousand dollars 
Now, do I think that's going to happen um, if it, there's a Democratic sweep? No, I do not, because they've already said um, if it's less than four hundred thousand dollars, we're not adjusting those tax rates. Um, but it, then if you're up and, and obviously that progression continues, the more money you make, you'll see a more increase uh, in tax, mainly because of the shifting of the brackets and the requirement that, um, you know, income be susceptible to higher income tax rates much sooner. So that's definitely something you you want to you want to look at. Um, and so that's one major difference that we have. Right. Um, between the between the policies, we'll talk more about Trump's policies last uh, next week. But I do want to point out that in general, he's saying he's going the Republicans would keep the, the Tax Cut and Jobs Act expiring provisions and just continue with them. Um, and so, hence, maybe why you're seeing a significant difference in the estimated um, budget impact. So that's that's one. They want to increase 37 percent to 39.6 percent. Um, and they indu- indeed are, are going to be adjusting those brackets accordingly. Um, and so people might say, OK, you know, that doesn't seem um, that different. I guess I would maybe uh, use that terminology. But then on top of that, there's a little there's a, a variety of other things that are, are going to come into play. So the, the next thing I want to talk about is long term capital gains rates and also something called the net investment income tax. Um, so long-term capital gains rates, if, if you uh, you know are a tax geek like me, you know these, um, the maximum rate is 20%. So if I um, sell a, a piece of property, if I sell an investment and I've held on to it longer than one year, um, they're essentially encouraging that type of behavior, right, um, uh, to, to be saving, to be um, investing. And so they say, we are essentially going to give you a, a smaller rate, a 20% rate. Uh, under the Harris tax policy plan, it would appear um, she did deviate from Biden a little bit on this particular subject. And Biden said, if you make more than a million dollars of taxable income, we're going to change that 20 percent and we're going to increase that to be um, based on your ordinary income tax rates. So um, we're going to have instead of you being getting a 20 percent rate. Remember, I just previously talked about that the top tax rate for individuals would be thirty nine point six. Um, they're saying, yes, that's the rate that would apply to your long-term cap gains. So that's significantly different, right? That was almost a 20% increase. Um, more recently, we have seen Vice President Harris a- announce that they are going to cap that and not put it at ordinary income tax rates, but say anyone making a million dollars or more in taxable income, their long-term capital gains rates will no longer be taxed at 20%, but they will be taxed at 28%, so an 8% increase. So many of you might be saying, I'm not going to be in that million dollar tax bracket. Okay, next subject. The next subject that I'd like to talk about, which is is just for people who are making $400,000 or more, has to do with our net investment income tax. So coupled with uh, the 20%, they essentially say, if you're selling investment type income, right? Um, So you would say uh, stocks, bonds, uh, qualified dividends, et cetera, if you're receiving that, you right now, if you make four hundred thousand dollars or more, are getting taxed at three point eight percent. And the um, proposal currently said, "Well, we're going to increase that three point eight to five percent." So now we're seeing our individual income tax rates kind of shift up. Now we're seeing our, uh, you know, it, it's it's uh, reasonable to say that now your uh, long term capital gains rate for investment income will be twenty five percent instead of twenty three point eight percent. Obviously. It would be 32% if you're over that $1 million taxable income. So those are, those are some significant changes. Um, and then uh, lastly, you know, when we're, we're dealing in that, in that section, um, it, it, it is significant and, and concerning for some who are worried that people will just hold on to their investments now and wait for better tax rates in the future, which means that kind of slows our market down a little bit. Um, so that's the other thing I would point out. Uh, you know, with the individual income tax rates, you got, you have to earn your dollar of income, right? Um, to 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 move forward every day, you don't have to sell your property, you don't have to um, you know um, sell stocks and bonds um, to you know that year. There's planning that people might push that forward um, to wait for a potential better answer. The one item that I really like to strike or point out in this area that isn't talked a lot about because we don't know, right? We don't, we don't have a specific policy, but in the build back uh, better plan, 
Um, similar increase, 3.8% to 5%. But in addition, um, they expanded that 5% net investment income tax proposal to S corporation shareholders and partners in a partnership who actively participate. So when you think about the terminology, net investment income tax, you think about, okay, if I don't materially participate in the business and I receive income, net investment income tax, um, interest, dividends, um, uh, capital gains, net investment income tax. I'm selling something in which it's it's passive, essentially, or it's an investment. Um, the concern I have now is that to come potentially back on the table, because as we talked about in the beginning of the podcast, many of these policies are adding significant money um, to the deficit. And the deficit is already kind of at, as we discussed in the very first podcast, a, a tipping point. Uh, so the concern that I have is now let's talk about what that would mean. So currently right now, if I'm active in a partnership or I'm a S corporation shareholder running my business, I am not susceptible to that 3.8%. Um, but there is a possibility if they follow language from the Build Back Better plan that we they now all of their income from the business that they're running is going to be taxed at an additional 5%. So now when we add up all those things, right? We're saying, okay, 37 to 39.6, everyone's paying a higher tax even if not in the 37% marginal tax rate because the shifting of the, of the brackets. Again, it, with anticipation that they wouldn't shift the brackets for people making $400,000 or less. Then you come into the second section and you say, okay, I might have to pay 25% on my net investment income tax if I have taxable income over 400,000. But on top of that, I previously never used to pay net investment income tax on my pass through earnings because I'm active in the business. And now I'm going to have to pay an additional 5%. Um, so we're seeing, you know, that depending on where uh, the, the line is, is drawn within these broad policy positions that we don't know specifically of where they're headed, you know, it could, it could deviate quite a bit depending on, on, you know, how much they plan to mimic the build back better plan or how much they're willing to um, say, yes, we're going to mimic it, but not to that extent of taxing, um, um, income from operational businesses at five at additional 5%. So that's kind of the second point I like to, to raise. Um, the third point, which is obviously near and dear to my heart is 199A. So again, I'm not, you can read articles, you can hear other podcasts of where I go in and I talk about 199A was really put out there um, to provide some parity with the significant decrease in the C corporation tax rate. So at a blip, we'll say the C corporation tax rate before the TCGA was indeed um, 35% and it got dropped to 21% for 14 percentage points. And now you had all these pass-through entity owners saying, okay, well, my highest top tax rate used to be 39.6%. Now it's 37%. That's not a significant move like the C corporations have seen. What can you, what can you, what can you do for me? Like, it doesn't seem fair that I also would not get a reduction in my tax rate. So things to keep in mind that I always like to point out because people say, well, we have to, some people might presume we have to give a lower C corporation tax rate um, because of all the, the revenue and the job employment um, that the C corporations multinationals bring to us. And while it, it's true, right? That some of those do bring a lot of employment, right? Like the Walt Disney worlds of the world. We understand that. But in totality, when you look at all the C corporation taxpayers versus the past entity taxpayers, what you find is um, more recently the the revenue um, has switched over that the revenue being generated by pass through entity owners is greater than the revenue we get from C corporations. Um, and then the second point that's important is pass through entity owners employ more people across the United States than C corporations. And then lastly, pass through entity owners tend to be not um, located in a, in a metropolitan city, but spread across the United States into communities um, and, and non-metropolitan communities. And so it's important to realize that they are, you know, kind of making up the bread and butter outside of the large cities. So all of that, you know, reemphasizes that we need to be careful about how much strain we're going to put on that group. And so under the, the currently... Under uh, the Vice President Harris proposal, they are essentially saying the 199A deduction um, will go away. 
And that what that means essentially is the 199A deduction allowed you to say, okay, you have to pass through a lot of loopholes to get there. Um, but essentially what they said is, okay, um, I see the corporate tax rate dropped significantly 14 percentage points for certain partnerships. So not accounting, not law firms, not um, health, you know, healthcare services, but for manufacturers, for um, uh, construction, et cetera. We're going to say you're allowed um, to essentially get a 20% deduction when calculating um, your tax due. So in other words, many of you are experiencing this, this impact now, instead of paying an effective tax rate, our highest tax rate being at 37%, you're only being subjected to 30%. So you're saving um, a set with, in relation to your pass through entity income, you're saving um, an additional you know, um, 7%. That will go away um, currently under the Harris proposal if you have taxable income over $400,000. And so that's where I'm saying to my, uh, to my clients, just we're going to hold here and see what happens. Um, but if we should see 199A go away, if we should see now all your your or, your ordinary income from your pass through entity is going to be subject to an additional five percent, and then oh by the way, all your in, individual income tax rates are going up, we we could definitely see a significant increase in taxes paid by that kind of pass through entity um, group, and so it's going to be really important. Um, for planning, to be honest with you, um, to to go through and and see and monitor these these compromises, these policies. Obviously, knowing them now, but monitoring what they could be after the November election um, is going to be very important in this in, in this um, long term play. Um, the problem I th- think I feel most of our clients are saying is, okay, well they're going to have tax reform in 2025. They could easily say that that tax reform. Um, applies to 1125. And now I'm sitting here and I, I didn't have enough bandwidth or time or understanding of what these policies were to adjust and, and tweak how I how I am dealing with these policy changes in, in 2024. And I don't, and essentially um, they're saying, you know, it, it's too short of a runway for me to do proper planning. And I would say, you know, let's see, because even though, um, you know, there are Many people uh, in Congress that are saying they would like, indeed, for a, a tax policy to be presented, um, you know, in the first quarter of the year, um, especially the Republicans, they're saying we want to uh, address the tax policy reform or tax reform before we talk about the um, the debt ceiling. Um, the, their ability to do that is is really going to be limited if it's not a pure sweep by the Democrat or Republican Party. And so it could very well, you know, take quite some time in 2025 or even early 2026 to find that compromise. Or you might see them doing a two year kick the bucket down the road extension and saying, okay, we're going to just extend all these items for two more years so we can come up with a a, a robust plan. Um, So we have to, we have to wait and see Um, some other items that I would just point out that the um, Harris vice president Harris uh, policy has also talked about is a stepped up basis um, so this essentially is saying uh, if you are a donor or deceased owner of appreciated assets, um, so think I have buildings, right? I, I bought this building um, in a city where I only paid 200000 and now it's worth five hundred, six hundred thousand. 600000 um, They're essentially saying that we would require um, that a capital gain be realized at the time of transfer, which normally doesn't occur currently, right? So if I gift something, um, I obviously have to use my um, gift exemption, but there's no triggering of capital gain. Um, and obviously the, the similar um, with if you um, receive something upon death, they do provide a $5 million exclusion. So they're talking about um, big gains. Um, the problem I foresee with this is when you're talking about non-tangible or non-cash uh, property, um, and, I, and I speak and I spoke with various farmers um, in the South and Texas, you know, when their family passes out down land for cattle ranching, for example, year after years, you know, in the family upon death of the of, of the the elder for them to pay this tax, which it could be right, because land has become very expensive in the United States. They would have to sell their land. Right. So there is there is going to have to be some discussion around this topic. I think it it, it could be 
again, um, very difficult for people to make cash um, to be able to pay this if they're not dealing with a uh, an easily transferable um, item. And then on top of that, um, just overall people thinking whether or not that that should indeed occur. It, it's kind of against um, policies that have been put in place the last few years. Um, the other item that they talk a lot about is um, a 25% billionaire's tax on total income, um, including unrealized capital gains for taxpayers with wealth exceeding $100 million. Um, so we talked about this on our last podcast for individuals. Um, we call it the, um, you know, the unearned tax. So essentially saying if you have $100 million or more, um, you have the ability to go and take, you know, to leverage that and get a loan, and that's your cash supply without paying taxes. They're saying where other people would have to indeed cash out or do different things in their life, um, which would create a taxable event. Uh, a lot of discussion around this. Um, Senator Elizabeth Warren, I believe, was uh, proposed this years ago. Um, I will only say the administrative burden that that could create um, might, 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 as I said it three times, um, stop this in its tracks. Um, but more importantly, some people are saying, um, indeed, it would be held unconstitutional. So um, I wouldn't get too caught up um, in in that particular one quite yet, but obviously something um, that we'll be monitoring. Uh, those are all the major um, d- domestic federal um, discussion points with the Democratic uh, uh, policy, tax policy, and we're, we're excited to, to present them to you. Um, we'll also have an article um, associated with this when we distribute the podcast, um, but that's really step one. So we just covered where the Democratic Party's focus is going to be. Um, and next time we speak, we'll talk more about um, where the Trump Party um, is going to be. And essentially, if they do keep all the Tax Cut and Jobs Act, you know, where where is the revenue coming to for the operation of, of the federal government and the, and the country? So thanks for joining us today. Um, we hope you took something away and we look forward to our, our final and last podcast next week on Trump policies. Take care. You've been listening to Withens Tax and Topics. Contact us with your feedback or suggestions for future podcast topics. Visit www.withen.com for additional information. Send an email to info at Witham.com or follow us on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter at Witham CPA. Thank you for listening.